Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live streamed presentation, Water and Ice in the Solar System with Rick Wallace. I am Galen Gessler with Pajarito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico. I will be the moderator for today's talk, and tonight, tonight's talk is being recorded. We are able to offer programming at this time because of our wonderful members and donors. So we'd like to thank all of you for your continuing support. Rick Wallace has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz. He worked as a staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory for 30 years, working on physics simulations. His hobbies include nature photography and astronomy education. Rick, I'll turn it over to you and I'll turn off my video. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Galen, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, you may or may not know that uh, the uh, peak uh, sometimes has themes, and the theme for January is water and ice. Um, now, peak has many programs talking about water and ice on the Earth and, and the ecosystems and so on. So I'm going to focus on water and ice away from the Earth, in particular, uh, in our own solar system. Okay. Now, water is interesting as far as astronomy goes and for many other people because it is a requirement for life. Uh, NASA defines life as a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Um, we define life by our primitive understanding of life on planet Earth. From our observations, uh, life requires water or at least a solvent perhaps organic solvents like we might find on Titan, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but water is a universal solvent. Uh, it dissolves many substances, uh, making extremely, uh, it extremely valuable at transporting materials in and out of living cells. Uh, life also involves carbon, and life requires an energy source to eat. So those are the three um, <clears throat> things that life as we know it uh, requires. Of course, there could be other kinds of life, but those, that's the kind that we know of. Uh, we conclude that where there is liquid water, complex carbon-based molecules, that life may also exist. An energy source could be chemical, um, such as methanogenesis, a light, photosynthesis, and so on. There are some extreme life examples here on Earth. So we'll talk about those just briefly. Uh, there are bacterial spores that are over 40 million years old, hardened by radiation exposure, or hardened to radiation exposure. Bacteria found living in the cold and dark in a lake buried a half mile deep under the ice in Antarctica, never sees sunshine. Uh, and things like the Pompeii worm and other um, life forms that are found only at hydrothermal vents in temperatures up to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there are other examples, for example, tardigrades or water bears. They can tolerate temperatures uh, down to minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit and up to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Pressure is six times greater than the deepest ocean trenches. Ionizing radiation at doses hundreds of times higher than uh, the lethal do dose for a human. The vacuum of outer space that has survived outside space capsules during launch, space transit, and re-entry. They can go without food or water for more than 30 years, drawing out uh, and then rehydrating, uh, foraging, and reproducing uh, when they have a source of water again. I'll talk about the wood frog in just a minute. Uh, tardigrades, by the way, will survive on Earth until the sun becomes a red giant in maybe 5 billion years. It has to evaporate all water on Earth to kill uh, the water bears. So they will not be killed by huge asteroid impacts, supernova, gamma ray bursts, or a full out nuclear war. Now, here's a short video about the uh, Alaskan wood frog. It survives the winter every year, goes through a multiple freeze thaw cycles. And this is from uh, the PBS show, uh, Living Eden's Denali National Park in Alaska. Magic transformation is also felt beneath the ground in the melting tomb of the frozen wood frog.
miraculously, an icy death grip yields to life resurrection. Frog emerges to a world reborn. I mentioned these microbes found under Antarctic ice. Uh, they consume sulfides, iron, carbon, and nitrogen to get their energy rather than using photosynthesis or other more common energy sources. I'm not going to play this video because it's kind of long and it's just not quite as impressive to me as the wood frog. I just can't imagine that thing freezing itself like that multiple times every year. Um, there we go. The three most common elements in the universe include, of course, hydrogen, hydrogen and helium uh, compose most of the universe, uh, but there's hydrogen, Oxygen is uh, the next most abundant after helium. Uh, water, of course, being H2O. Uh, the rest of the next five or six isotopes that are most abundant in the universe are exactly what we find in our bodies, which is probably not a coincidence. <coughs> <coughs> now, most of you know the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. We won't get into the Big Bang here. We've done that in other shows. But the expanding universe, if you run it backward, it implies a rapid expansion from some point, a Big Bang. Um, and that nucleosynthesis that occurred during that very hot, dense point seemed to create about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, and a smattering of a few other things. So hydrogen is the most common uh, element in the universe. We'll talk about oxygen in a minute. Um, but the largest and most distant reservoir of water that we know about in the universe to date uh, is a quasar. Uh, that is 12 billion light years away, it has a black hole of 20 billion solar masses, uh, and it has 4,000 times more water than our Milky Way galaxy. Now, closer to home, uh, interstellar gas clouds contain uh, huge amounts of water. We have these large molecular clouds throughout our galaxy, mostly in the spiral arms. And we know that they contain a great deal of water because of basic spectroscopy. A quick reminder of spectroscopy, you know, white light, uh, it, if you split it uh, with a prism into its component colors, you get red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Uh, an incandescent solid, like a metal, for example, that is heated uh, will produce a continuous spectrum, red through blue and there will be a more energy produced uh, in certain wavelengths than others, uh, wavelengths designating different colors. So as it begins to heat up, it will look red, and then if it gets hotter, it will look more uh, yellow and then white, and if you get it hot enough, it will look more green or blue. Um, so that is a continuous spectrum from a heated source. Now, on the other hand, if instead of a continuous source that you're heating up, you take a, a thin, uh, low density gas, and you heat up that gas, it will emit uh, spectral lines. And those spectral lines uh, are unique to that particular element, that particular gas that has been uh, being that's being heated. And that's why we see different colors. in when we look at uh, nebulae with uh, long exposure photographs, the, uh, this is uh, the Horsehead Nebula in Orion. Uh, the red uh, is most likely hydrogen, and it is being ionized by ultraviolet light from stars nearby. And uh, when, it, when that occurs, uh, it gives off a red light. Uh, it, oxygen tends to give off a green light, and other elements give off other lights. By looking at the specific spectral lines, we can get a very good idea of exactly what these uh, elements are. As an example, uh, I'll show you uh, this. Now, everyone knows that a lightsaber um, is actually powered by kyber crystals, but uh, 
if there weren't fiber crystals, and this was just, for example, a long fluorescent tube that was uh, um, energized by an electric current, then when I turn it on, now you won't be able to see this in the camera very well, but it's actually glowing a bright red. And uh, that's because, uh, it, for example, if there were hydrogen gas in here and it is excited by something, a current in this case, then it glows in its characteristic color, um, green for oxygen and so on. Now, let's look at another phenomena of spectroscopy. <clears throat> if you take uh, a cold gas now, not a hot gas, but a cold one, and you put it in front of a uh, continuous spectrum. So we have this something heated up, say, for example, a star or the sun, uh, where the interior is producing a continuous spectrum. And then you have a relatively cold gas. So instead of thousands, many hundred, uh, 10, 20,000 degrees or higher, um, gas, maybe only a 5,000 degree gas, which is cool on the surface of the sun, uh, that cold gas in front of the continuous spectrum will produce absorption lines. <laughs> and that absorption spectrum uh, will contain those lines uh, based on the elements that are in that gas in the outer atmosphere of that star or, or the sun. Uh, and they will be at precisely the same locations that the emission spectrum would have been if that gas itself had been heated up. There are some absorption lines of various chemical elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on. So we can use this to look and try to understand what the chemical or, or atomic or chemical compounds are uh, in, for example, nebulae uh, the, or gases uh, in space. Now, molecular clouds in space are cold enough that they may actually form molecules such as carbon dioxide or methane or water. Uh, water has very characteristic spectrum. Molecules have a spectrum just like uh, atomic uh, elements do, um, although it's more toward the infrared for water. Uh, but our telescopes today can see the spectral lines. Uh, Hubble has imaged 200 protoplanetary disks in the Ryan Nebula alone. Uh, these are disks that are beginning to collapse and form little solar systems or stellar systems. And there, the sun has, uh, or the star in the center, has become bright enough that it's beginning to shine and produce uh, light that's affecting the nebula. And we can look at the spectra of those gas clouds and find that there is a tremendous amount of water there. And specific examples uh, are uh, these, you know, half dozen or so um, protoplanetary disks where we find not only water, but um, magnesium, silicon, iron, oxygen, uh, a number of other things, even ice, if, uh, if it's cool, cold enough. Now, so the formation of water in the universe, you have the Big Bang that creates hydrogen helium, especially hydrogen. Stars, as they go through their life cycles, uh, will burn hydrogen, um, fuse, nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium and then into other elements, um, and then continue on with oxygen, carbon, and so on. Um, supernovas at the end of the star's life it burns up all of the fuel that it has it collapses so if it's a large enough star uh, maybe 10 times larger than our sun uh, it will collapse at the end of its life because there's no more nuclear energy holding it up against gravity and a supernova is produced when a supernova is produced a lot of that material that's been generated in the star including oxygen carbon is blown out into interstellar space these materials mix with the interstellar clouds and then when the next interstellar cloud begins to um, contract under its own gravitational attraction and form these protostellar clouds or protostellar uh, disks and eventually a solar system or stellar system like our own sun, uh, then uh, that will incorporate these other chemicals such as oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and so on. So, uh, now, when the early solar system was formed, and we actually have a talk on that uh, later on in the spring about the formation of the, of the solar system, check out the PEAK website for that information. But um, when the solar system was formed, there was a very um, rough portion of that solar system uh, where there were little rocks, protoplanets and other things, asteroids that were being uh, formed within the protostellar nebula. 
And those things were colliding and hitting each other all the time. It was a very violent place, heated up a lot of things. And we think that our proto-Earth, which was an accumulation of material, uh, was hit by so many of these things that it probably evaporated a good deal of the water. Uh, and then that water may have been replaced by comets and asteroids. Now, it turns out water uh, is not just H2O, it's hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and there are different kinds of um, hydrogen. There's uh, the normal hydrogen where you have a proton uh, surrounded by an electron. You have deuterium with a proton and a neutron in the nucleus or tritium, which has a proton and two nuclei, uh, two neutrons. Uh, tritium doesn't occur naturally, but deuterium does and it's stable and it'll be around for a while. So what we can do is we can look at various sources of water, look at the hydrogen in that water and see how much deuterium there is compared to the simple hydrogen. Uh, so D2O compared to H2O. And uh, when we do that, what we find is that the water on the Earth is of a particularly predominant ratio of these uh, types of hydrogen atoms in the water. Uh, comets do not have that ratio by and large, but asteroids do. Now by asteroids, I'm referring to, if you can look at my little tiny video in the corner, not something like this. This is a uh, nickel uh, iron asteroid. You can see from the cutaway, it's very, very dense. It's extremely heavy um, and it doesn't, would not have a great deal of water in it. But if we had a carbonaceous chondrite asteroid, and this is a chondritic asteroid, it's much lighter. It's not as dense. You can see the different uh, uh, color formations. It almost looks wet. It's not really, uh, but there can be water uh, contained within the grains in that um, uh, asteroid. And one theory is that most of the water uh, that we find on the surface of the Earth anyway, maybe not on the interior, but on the surface, may have come to the Earth from asteroids. So let's talk about the rest of the solar system, or at least part of it. Uh, first, let me mention uh, in terms of the sun, uh, and here's an Earth to scale there. Uh, there are things like the solar wind that's blowing ions off of the sun all the time, uh, and solar prominences, uh, which are big flares caused by magnetic field tanglements uh, on the sun. Uh, there are also something called the coronal mass ejection, where magnetic fields, as they untangle themselves, uh, shoot jets of uh, matter into uh, the solar system of charged particles, mostly protons and electrons. Now, these charged particles uh, are an ionized plasma, and that goes out to where the planets are. In the case of the Earth, we have our own magnetic field around the Earth, and that protects us to some extent. These uh, ions are uh, routed around the Earth, and uh, the ones that do make it through our magnetic field generally come down on the poles. Uh, to produce the auroras, uh, but most of it is, is routed around the Earth. That becomes important, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. That shields the Earth from being blasted uh, by these, uh, these particles. Other planets uh, and their satellites may not have such magnetic fields for protection, and in those cases, uh, their atmospheres are more susceptible to being swept away into space by this char these charged particles from the sun. Now, the Earth actually has less water on it than other bodies in our solar system. Um, for example, Europa, uh, well, and Titan. Um, in these diagrams, you'll see several of them. You'll see a little ball of water, and that ball of water is to scale. Uh, if you took all of the water, say, on the Earth and put it into a sphere, um, that you would have a sphere of that scaled size. So if you look at Europa, if you take all the water on Europa and put it into a sphere, you would have a much bigger sphere than uh, the one on the Earth. If you did the same thing with Titan, bundled up all its water, put it into a sphere, you see that you have a much bigger um, amount of water than we have on the Earth. Uh, only about, oh yes, let me see that, only about one-tenth of one percent of the Earth's volume is water. Now, the Earth, I said I wasn't going to say much about the Earth. We'll just mention um, that uh, the hydrogen helium may indeed have been driven away uh, by the solar wind early in the Earth's history, uh, at least some of it. Uh, the early atmospheric 
uh, atmosphere was replenished from volcanic eruptions with CO2, water vapor, ammonia, methane, and so on. Um, oxygen only appeared in the Earth's atmosphere about 2 billion years later after photosynthesis of life in the oceans, cyanobacteria occurred. Um, and then, as I said, there is a theory that most of the current water may have been uh, deposited on the Earth's surface by asteroids and asteroid collisions. It's the only planet in the solar system uh, with the oceans of water on its surface. And the scale of the Earth is such, uh, just because I thought this was interesting, that if you scaled it down to the size of a cue ball, it would be completely smooth. You wouldn't be able to detect any um, mountains or, or valleys on the Earth. Let's go and talk about the moon. Now, the moon does have ice on it, and we knew that um, for some time. It was absolutely confirmed, uh, fairly recently, actually, in August of 2018. Um, the distribution of the surface ice on the moon's south pole, which is shown to the left, <coughs> and north pole on the right, was detected by NASA's uh, Moon Mineralogy Mapper instrument. And the blue represents the location of uh, ice plotted over an image of the lunar surface where the gray scale corresponds to surface temperatures such that darker represents colder areas and lighter shades indicate um, warmer areas. Um, this was the first time that scientists had uh, directly observed a definitive evidence of water ice on the moon's surface and it's concentrated in the poles where there are deep shadows in some of these craters and it's shadowed throughout the um the day of the moon you know the moon um, revolves it has a, a day that's a, a length of about a month which is the same as its orbital period um and during that time uh, these deep craters have shadows in, on the poles that are continuously uh, shaded and uh, below freezing temperatures. However, we just found out something new. This is last October of 2020. This is just a few months ago. They found water on the sunlit surface of the moon. Now, exactly how that got there, they're not sure. They're still working on that. Uh, the uh, prevailing theory is that it was delivered by meteorites, just like it might have been on the Earth. Um, the glass beads from micrometeorites could trap water. Um, but the uh, instruments that detected this have a difficulty uh, detecting the difference between water and ice. So it's not clear exactly what form it's in. Could be trapped in the voids uh, between the lunar uh, dust. The water was detected at six microns wavelength, which is in the infrared. And the detection is the equivalent of a 12 ounce bottle of water per cubic meter of soil. So it's not a lot of water. Um, it's sort of like uh, something like a bottle like this in a cubic meter of soil. But there could be greater concentrations existing elsewhere that was not on a part of the moon that was observed uh, by the instruments. And water may uh, accumulate in permanently shadowed craters and indentations on the surface called micro cold traps with temperatures of minus 260 degrees. And these could cover about 15,000 square miles. So there actually could be a significant amount of water and that could have uh, a large impact on uh, the plans that NASA has for sending astronauts and perhaps establishing moon bases on the moon. Here's a little video about that. The world's largest flying observatory is named Sophia.
So with future missions, we'll find out more about water on the moon. Um, let's move on to the closest planet to the sun, uh, Mercury orbits uh, in uh, an 88 day orbit. Uh, it is tidally locked with the sun. That means its rotation period is about 59 days, it's not completely locked, but in a resonance. And the, um, that means that it takes it a long time. The one particular location is going to be uh, very hot because it's pointing toward the sun uh, for many days, and then it will be very cold when it's pointed away. So the temperatures vary from 780 degrees Fahrenheit um, in the daytime to minus 360 degrees Fahrenheit at the nighttime. Mercury has a diameter of well, 3,000 miles, a little bit bigger than the Earth's moon. Messenger spacecraft uh, visited there uh, between 2011 and 2015 and found that Mercury has water ice in the permanently shadowed polar craters. Again, at the poles, um, there's not such a big difference between daytime and nighttime. Uh, in the deep shadows, it's always dark and it's always cold. So there is uh, a, a little bit of uh, water there. Um, and there are various theories about how that might have uh, arrived uh, involving both potentially asteroids, but also strong solar bombardment of protons, some of which combine with hydroxyls. Uh, in the soil to produce water and then migrate along very, very weak magnetic field lines to the poles. But whatever they formed this water, there is some water in these shadowed areas, uh, but not very much, very, very little. Now let's look at the next planet out, Venus, um, uh, next planet from the sun. It has no magnetic field, so the hydrogen component of the original water was stripped out of the atmosphere by the solar wind. It now has uh, only one thousandth the amount of water in its atmosphere that uh, the Earth does. Um, its orbit takes 225 days to complete, about seven and a half months. Um, and so it doesn't, it's very dry, it's very hot, um, not a lot of water left in Venus. We know about the Earth, so let's sk skip that and go on to Mars. Mars has a diameter about half of that of the Earth. And its mass is only a tenth of the Earth's mass, which means its gravity is one third that of the Earth. And that becomes important in the story of water and its atmosphere. The surface temperature averages around 60 uh, to 20 degrees below uh, zero Fahrenheit. And it's one day, the rotation on its axis is about the same as the Earth. It's also tilted 23 degrees or so. And so it's very similar to the Earth in that respect. Uh, so people thought, Maybe Mars is inhabited, maybe it has an atmosphere, maybe it has water on its surface and so on um, a few hundred years ago. Well, <clears throat> maybe not so much now that we've sent spacecraft there. Uh, here's a comparison of planet sizes. Notice how small Mercury is. Venus is almost the same size as the Earth, um, but a little too close to the sun. Mars, again, half the size of the Earth. Mars's internal structure is quite different from the Earth though. Um, the planet cannot generate a magnetic field without a rotating liquid core that has convection in it. Mars is small, so it cooled earlier than the Earth. It has a solid core, so it has no magnetic field. Mars has a much thinner atmosphere than the Earth, um, and only 0.6% uh, as much pressure at the surface as the Earth does. Uh, and it's almost all carbon dioxide. So Mars atmosphere seems to have been stripped by that solar wind that we talked about earlier. Now, the uh, MAVEN spacecraft that visited a few years ago uh, verified this by taking measurements of what was being stripped off the surface of Mars uh, and this Martian atmosphere uh, downstream in the solar wind uh, beyond Mars. And so it appears that uh, again, it has lower gravity because it's smaller, it has no magnetic field, and so the early atmosphere of Mars was easily stripped off by solar flares, solar winds, um, and uh, coronal mass, e mass ejections. Um, we have explored Mars looking for water and life. Curi this is the Curiosity rover, took a selfie on Mars when it landed in uh, 2012. Here are a couple of the first, uh, first photographs that it took. Uh, looking out over Mars. The 
water streaks, flow formations, minerals, polar ash, ice cap observations, all indicate a historical flowing water on the surface of Mars. Uh, here's an example of a photo of a Mars crater. You see the black streaks there. And the Echo Amphitheater um, picture that I took uh, a few years ago, just north of uh, Santa Fe in Española. And uh, you can see the similarity in these in these streaks. Um, this is the Kimberley Strata near Mount Sharp, indicating an ancient lake. They also found hematite at the Opportunity Landing Site on Mars uh, that's very similar to the smooth layered hematite deposited by water dissolved iron in Utah. And these are very specific uh, shaped objects. Here's one of the Utah ones. I wish I had one from Mars, but I don't. Um, this one is from Utah. It kind of looks like a bit of like a mushroom to me. Um, but this is from, uh, again, water dissolved iron. We also have photographs of snow and ice covered dunes on the Mars uh, northern hemisphere. Some of this is carbon dioxide. Uh, but some seems to be uh, regular water as well. And then we found these things. This, these were images taken from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of images of icy areas on Mars. If you look at where these little um, squares are, uh, figure 2a, 2b, 4a, especially in here, and you zoom in on that, this is very, very high resolution imagery. So there's not very much of it on Mars, but what there is is very high resolution. And you see this. The blue indicates where there is ice. They've so far found eight locations um, by 2018, and, and they're, they're still looking. Uh, these are 100 meter thick ice shelves that are just under the surface of Mars. Um, on the order of three to six feet below the surface. And they are easy, could be easily accessible by future astronauts. This high resolution data is only examined about 3% of the Martian surface so far. So there may be many more of these areas uh, where there's water just below the surface. And of course that water can be used not only for water, for drinking or whatever, um, but it can be used for fuel. If they separate the hydrogen and the oxygen, then those become components for rocket fuel. Okay, um, the, so what did Mars, uh, this is the subsurface uh, water on Mars gathered by a number of instruments uh, from these Martian orbiters uh, that would appear that uh, there was a considerable amount of water uh, under the surface of Mars, a little deeper than the ones that I just showed you. And there's, of course, some uh, surface water uh, in uh, shadowed craters, just like in some of the other planets. Uh, the idea is that maybe 3.8 billion years ago, Mars may have looked like this, may have looked a lot more like the Earth. Uh, but again, the atmosphere stripped uh, away by the uh, solar wind and that lowered the pressure, the water evaporated and then itself was stripped away. So there's not as much of it unless it's underground. The relative water content on Mars compared to the Earth is shown by these little water spheres again. You can see that there's not as much water on Mars as there is on the Earth. And we'll get to Europa in a moment. So is there life on Mars? Well, life as we know it is perhaps not likely. Um, we send a lot of little robotic things to Mars and they haven't seen uh, bustling cities yet. Um, but in terms of microbes under the surface in these water layers, that's something that for example, the uh, space probe that will be landing on Mars next month is specifically going to be looking for. Now, asteroids, I mentioned asteroids may have water in them. Um, we'll talk about that as well. This is you know, the next uh, bunch of things out from, uh, from the sun after Mars is the asteroid belt. Its total mass is about 4% of the mass of the moon. Um, we actually sent a spacecraft there, uh, Dawn, the Dawn probe in 2016, looked at the Ceres uh, asteroid, which is both an asteroid and a dwarf planet. Uh, the size, here's a size comparison of Ceres. Uh, you have the Earth and the Moon, and then Ceres is this little thing down here. The next largest uh, astro uh, sized asteroid in the asteroid belt <laughs> is Vesa, 
which you can see in the lower right, uh, not as, as large as Ceres. But uh, Dawn looked at Ceres in particular. Whoops. My mouse is giving me problems. Um, so Ceres may have as much water as all the fresh water on Earth, not, not all the water, not all the seawater, but all the fresh water on Earth. There is a thin, crusty outer crust, a rocky inner core. And uh, from measurements given by the spacecraft, it looks like perhaps a water ice layer in between those. And you can see this white material on the Akator crater and on some other craters as well. It may contain dried salts from an underground ocean, most likely brine containing uh, sodium carbonate that uh, bubbled up in cracks on the surface. Uh, and then um, the water that was in it uh, evaporated into space or sublimated into space and it left this material behind. Let's move out farther to the large planet Jupiter. Jupiter is in fact the largest planet in our solar system. Uh, you can see the statistics there, diameter is 11 times that of the Earth, uh, but it rotates so fast that one day, one rotation is only 12 hours. The temperature is cold, minus 230 degrees at the cloud tops. Um, it has 79 moons. The composition is mostly hydrogen and helium with clouds in the atmosphere of ammonium, methane, water, uh, ammonium, hydrosulfide, and some other things. Um, the volume can hold 1,300 Earths. If you got balls the size of the Earth and threw it into Jupiter, you could hold 1,300 of them. The pressure at its center is about 70 million atmospheres. Uh, this shows the fast rotation rate of Jupiter as the Voyager 1 spacecraft approached it. Uh, just a couple of quick photographs of the uh, atmosphere taken from various spacecraft. Uh, Juno had some great close-ups of the cloud tops of Jupiter in 2018. Whoops, there's an... There we go. All right, now the four largest moons of Jupiter, the ones that have been known the longest uh, of these 79 moons, uh, are actually visible from the Earth with binoculars. They were discovered by Galileo with his new 20-power telescope on January 7th of 1610 which was almost exactly 411 years ago. The uh, moons are known as Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and it shows their relative sizes. I'm not gonna talk about Io, it's so close to uh, Jupiter that um, it does not have as much ice on it as the others. So we're gonna skip straight to the other ones that are a little farther away from Jupiter and hence a little colder. Let's look at Europa. Europa is very interesting. You see all these uh, colorations and, and various areas and stripes and things uh, on the surface. The dark streaks are thought to be material that seeped up through cracks in an icy crust. The Hubble Space Telescope has actually imaged uh, plumes of water erupting from Europa. So best as we can tell, it looks like Europa has a metallic core, a rocky interior, and then this water ocean, salty water ocean, um, that is a liquid water underneath an ice covering. Now, the uh, uh, interior of Europa is close enough to Jupiter that it is continuously being squeezed uh, in different directions because of tidal forces uh, related to its orbit around Jupiter. And that squeezing heats up the interior and presumably makes that warm enough for this to be liquid water um, in, at, at when, when it gets up to sort of melted some of the interior ice uh, to be, form a liquid. And if we look at the amount of water that we think might be on Europa, again, there is that ball that's 430 miles in diameter that represents the amount of water on the Earth. The uh, blue ball next to Europa represents the amount of water in just underneath that ice uh, in Europa's ocean. In addition to that, there's also the ice itself, which is on top of the water. Now, uh, in the future, NASA is currently planning, depending on budgets, 
for the Europa Clipper mission to investigate Europa's ability to possibly support life. Uh, it's currently planned for a 2025 uh, launch. Um, the surface of Europa uh, has sodium chloride on its surface that glows yellow after bombardment with ions from Jupiter's magnetic field, but that suggests that this water underneath the ice is very much like the oceans on Earth, a sodium chloride salt water ocean. Uh, the Clipper mission will have a high resolution camera, ice penetrating radar, a gravitometer to look at liquid versus solid interior of the moon, um, a spectrometer to see exactly what some of these materials are, a magnetometer to measure the saltwater ocean and so on. There may even be a future lander mission for Europa. NASA is designing and testing various types of cryobots that might bore through the ice on Europa uh, and another moon very similar to it uh, that orbits Saturn called Enceladus, we'll talk about in a moment, uh, to reach this subsurface ocean. Uh, Valkyrie, for example, is a laser boring system being tested in Alaska right now. Uh, let's see. It uses a 5,000 watt industrial laser to bore through the ice, then releases an autonomous cryobot uh, drone. And another option being considered is the buoyant rover for under ice exploration, Rui. And I have a short film uh, talking about their current experiments in Alaska. The rover that our team has built is an early, early, early precursor of something that we may someday fly to Europa. The buoyant rover for under ice exploration designed to float on the underside of the ice and throw as the underside of the ice is the ground. These ecosystems up in Alaska, these lakes that, that freeze over uh, every year and then freeze down, they're just one example of life in an extreme environment that can help guide us in assessing whether or not a world like Europa could harbor life. We cut a hole in the ice, put the rover underneath the ice, and then left it out there to rove around. And we went back to a nice warm Quonset hut and our team was even able to hand over control to engineers down in JPL. And so we think this truly was the first time ever that an underwater, under ice, untethered vehicle has been operated through satellite links. Our work has this wonderful marriage of advancing our understanding of what's happening on our own planet while simultaneously feeding forward into our exploration of potentially habitable worlds beyond Earth. That is just one example of the type of rovers that they're looking at uh, trying to put into place for the uh, icy worlds, the moons of the uh, large outer planets. So Europa, being close to Jupiter, has a um, tidal interaction with Jupiter that causes it to be fairly warm. If you move out away from Jupiter a little bit to some of the arg other large moons, such as um, Ganymede, whoops. Um, again, it seems to be structured very similar to the structure that um, we saw with Europa. It's an icy world frozen on the outside with liquid water again under the ice, perhaps not as much liquid as Europa and maybe not as warm because it's farther from Jupiter, uh, but the same type of structure. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. It's larger than the planet Mercury even. Um, And uh, it has an internal structure that uh, is shown here, best as we can tell. Again, the ocean is about 60 miles thick, 10 times the Earth's ocean depth. Um, let me see, I understand I can turn this on again. Nope, I can't. 
Um, the co-hosting is not working again. Um, okay, so um, the amount of water on Ganymede is shown here, and it is a huge object. And so since a lot of it is frozen ice and frozen water, there's a tremendous amount of liquid water on uh, that moon, on Ganymede, compared to the Earth, for example, and even more ice in addition to the water. Try, to, try it again, Rick. Ah, that works. All right, thank you. The next moon out, Callisto, is one of the most heavily cratered in the solar system, actually. Um, concentric rings surround some of these, uh, these craters uh, where you can see the, the damage from the impact. Now, Callisto is the second largest moon of Jupiter. It appears to have, again, an icy surface, this time maybe 100 kilometers thick, covered, uh, covering a liquid water layer, maybe with some ammonia in it, uh, and then an ice rock core. Now, it's so far from Jupiter that there's not as much tidal heating, so there's not as much um, liquid water, uh, more ice, and we're not, and, and the, the thickness of that ice on the surface is, is pretty, pretty thick. But the total amount of water is, again, expected to be larger than that on the Earth. Um, the ice, of course, is, is huge. So let's move out to the next planet beyond Jupiter, and that is Saturn. Cassini had a very long mission studying Saturn, and it looked in detail at Saturn's rings, for example. The uh, rings seem to be made of a water ice and perhaps some dirt dusty particles <coughs> as well. It has 62 named moons in addition to the rings. Uh, and a total so far of 82 moons that have been identified. Some of these are really tiny. Uh, here's an example. Uh, Daphnis causes ripples in Saturn's ring system. You can kind of see the rippling um, as the little rock orbits uh, Saturn. Um, Mimas. Mimas is sort of called the Death Star of the moons and around Saturn. You can kind of guess why that might be. It was actually discovered in 1789 by English astronomer William Herschel and named for the giants of Greek mythology. It's about 400 kilometers across. Um, now we come to the more interesting ones. Saturn's moon Titan has a dense atmosphere and stable bodies of a surface liquid. Now the liquid on the surface is not water, it turns out to be methane, a hydrocarbon, um, but uh, Ligia Mare and Kraken Mare are hydrocarbon, mostly methane, seas, nearly the size of the Black Sea on Earth. Uh, now, methane is not conductive, so they are, it's radio transparent, but it's very cold at minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit. But since it's radio transparent, that gives us an opportunity to try to explore these with the future spacecraft. This is, whoops, come on. This is the, an early design of a robotic submarine to explore the bottom of Titan's Kraken Sea. Uh, and it uses all sorts of sensors and radio and radar and so on. Uh, again, it would be a remote uh, drone. And by the time uh, there is enough money to launch such an expedition to uh, such a remote uh, location of Saturn's moon Titan, uh, we hopefully will have autonomous cars and other thing, everything else, including autonomous drones. So this will not have to be controlled uh, from the Earth like the Martian rovers are. It will be autonomous and be able to move and explore on its own. Well, it allows it to explore much more rapidly uh, than if it were waiting for signals from the Earth. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system after Ganymede, which we just talked about, and is larger again than the planet Mercury. It may have a liquid water, not methane this time, but water ocean underneath its frozen surface. So it not only has methane on the lakes on the surface and a nitrogen atmosphere, but it has potentially a tremendous amount of liquid water underneath its surface. Again, it's very close to uh, its planet, in this case, Saturn. And so we have this tidal effect where the 
interior structure is disrupted by uh, gravity as it orbits uh, Titan, and that squeezing causes uh, melting of any ice that might be there into water. Uh, yes, it orbits Saturn. Sorry. And um, the uh, this diagram gives you an idea of the amount of water that we believe is underneath the surface on Titan compared to the amount of water on Earth. And you see it's just huge, a huge amount of ice too. And so this, again, has the same kind of potential that Europa had for some kind of life, perhaps, uh, in that liquid ocean. Now, the atmosphere is uh, mostly nitrogen, a little methane, hydrogen, and so on. Um, here's a photograph of the surface taken by uh, the Huygens lander. Um, but again, underneath that surface, there appears to be a great deal of water. So let's move on to Saturn's moon Enceladus. This one is really interesting. Enceladus, again, as we've seen before, seems to have liquid water under an icy surface. And the fountains of Enceladus have been uh, seen by many spacecraft. Cassini has had an opportunity to actually fly through those uh, plumes and analyze the material. And we'll talk about that. Here is a, a diagram of what we believe might be there. Uh, you have this saltwater ocean, uh, which we know has actually hydrocarbons in it. Uh, frozen ice above that, cracks in the ice where these geysers are shooting out. Uh, and the uh, bottom of this ocean, again, being stressed by gravitational tidal effects from its orbit around Saturn, uh, might produce these things that are called hydrothermal vents or black smokers. We have these in the bottom of the oceans on the Earth, uh, where there's a tremendous amount of minerals that are uh, brought up from lower in the planet, or in this case, the moon's um, core, uh, and contribute to the minerality of that ocean. Uh, in fact, one of the rings of Saturn, Saturn's E-ring, seems to be caused by uh, the outgassing of Enceladus. It's just, it's outgassing so much. It is perhaps the most promising place to look for extraterrestrial life. So this is the reason that in 2017, when Cassini uh, was at the end of its lifetime and it used up almost all of its fuel, it used the last bits of fuel uh, to be directed toward Saturn, to be burned up in Saturn's atmosphere so that it would be prevented from a future contamination of Enceladus by microbes that may have ridden on Cassini from the Earth. If Cassini had crashed into Enceladus at some point in the future, they didn't want to contaminate the surface, so they let Cassini burn up in, or directed Cassini to be burn up, burned up in Saturn's atmosphere. This is some of the chemical uh, information from that atmosphere. It has a warm saltwater ocean with complex organic mo molecules. Um, in, on Earth, there are organisms near the seafloor geothermal vents that use hydrogen and carbon dioxide as a fuel, as an energy source instead of photosynthesis. Uh, and that energy source is called methanogenesis. Um, the plumes of salt water contain hydrogen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, methane, and so on, as you can see here. Uh, and this molecular hydrogen could theoretically be metabolized uh, by methanogen microbes to provide the energy for life. So it looks like a very promising place uh, to look for life. We may yet find life in our solar system, but probably not macroscopic intelligent life. We've sent enough probes to enough places now that that seems to be uh, quite unlikely. However, Microscopic life in places like these uh, geothermal vents, um, you know, this is this is particularly possible, and it looks like two of the ones, uh, the locations that might be the most interesting, beyond the inner planets, would be the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, and and particularly Europa orbiting Jupiter, and Enceladus orbiting Saturn. Now, of course, we have not yet drilled into the water deposits on Mars, and we may still find something very interesting when we do that. And that process will begin to occur, uh, perhaps as early as next month. So um, that's what I have. 
I'll stop there. And if anyone has uh, questions, uh, let Galen look for those. Right, Rick, very nice talk. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning that today is in fact Rick's birthday. So um, let's all wish him a very happy birthday and many returns of the same. We do have some questions, three at the moment, and maybe there'll be more coming in. Um, James Werbel asks, why doesn't the ice on the moon sublimate? Oh, that's a really good question. So um, it should mostly sublimate. The only thing that's left would be um, ice that is either thick enough um, that it hasn't yet completely sublimated or um, that is continuously being deposited there. And if it's continuously being deposited, that could be related to micrometeorites, for example, um, and um, everything that is not near the, uh, the, the cold um, areas inside those craters uh, would, would in fact have, have been sublimated or there it's mixed with some grains. Uh, the idea for the water on the sunlit side uh, is that there could be micrometeorites containing that water or there could also be some water trapped within voids and, and grains. That could also be happening on the craters uh, in, the, uh, in the North Pole or South Pole. Uh, the moon seems to be the largest concentration. Uh, so there'd be something there that's kind of uh, trapping them. Uh, and if there's enough concentration, then that might be why that's why the spacecraft found those first. Um, that would be my guess. But for me, that's only a guess. It's not my area of expertise. It's a really, really good question. Um, Galen, do you have any more thoughts on that? Um, basically, what you what you said that, that, it, that it's probably, um, you know, combined with um, with other minerals. Um, I'm I don't know the details of the Sophia observations. Um, you know what what they actually how they actually detected the water. Um, you know, so maybe it is bound up um, with other stuff. So yeah, I don't know. Then um, Tate Plore asks, how do we know the internal structure of these planets and moons? That is a really excellent question. So there are a number of ways to um, determine that. It depends on the spacecraft uh, around that particular body. The easy way to do it is to use uh, gravitometry. That is, you orbit the spacecraft around the body, and that spacecraft, um, its orbital parameters are related to the uh, radial structure of the density of materials. Water has a very different density than rock and uh, the core of many things like asteroids, for example, or Earth or planets uh, is sort of iron nickel kind of stuff. Again, something that um, on this size is difficult for me to hold in one hand. It's so dense and heavy. Um, and yet water is, is much, much lighter. So um, that structural difference between the density um, affects the way something orbits. And we've been able to um, because we know a lot about the structure of the Earth, uh, we've been able to normalize that data to uh, objects that are orbiting near Earth, or, uh, satellites orbiting the Earth. And so we then apply that uh, when we go to Ceres, for example, or some of these other moons. So that's one way. Another way is to use a magnetometer. And um, that's a little bit more complex, but actually gives you a little bit more accurate uh, reading of water. Again, the spacecraft, the instruments on the spacecraft would behave differently uh, if there's water there than it would be if there's not water just under the surface. Um, the uh, one that is planning to be used in the future, if possible, is uh, to use uh, radar because water is not very transparent uh, to radar, um, but there is radar that can see, some radar that can see through ice. Um, and low frequency kinds of things. And so uh, this ice penetrating uh, radar might, might give us a better view of that as well. But it's mostly gravitometry so far. Oh, good, and, um, and Steve Becker asks, um, can you say something about ice six? I cannot, but I bet Steve can. So <laughs> I am not that familiar with ice six. So uh, Steve, if you wanna type something into the, into the chat there, or Galen, if you want to throw your your thoughts into this. 
<laughs> All I know is that, that it's an exotic type of ice that, that exists under high pressure. Let me unmute Steve um, and, um, and see, see what he wants to say about it. Steve, can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I've heard it's, it's a type of ice that actually can get red hot and still be solid under pressure. Oh. Uh, yeah. So that's why it was interesting. It's at the bottom. I thought, yeah, it's got to be ice under very high pressure into the new crystal form that you know could exist solid and still be hot enough to glow red. That is really interesting. It reminds me of the... Uh, the idea that Jupiter under tremendous pressure, the hydrogen gas, which we think of as lighter than air and floats and balloons and stuff, uh, might be um, squeezed into a metallic um, hydrogen uh, in the inner regions of uh, Jupiter because of the pressure. And I guess the water would behave in, in, in sort of an analogous way to produce that kind of ice, which I, I'm not familiar with. I hadn't heard of that. That's really interesting. Cool. I don't see any more questions um, unless um, anybody wants to type in. Oh, here's one. Marilyn Doolin asks, is the variety of life forms around fumaroles at the bottom of the Earth's ocean the same for all fumaroles? Or is there a large variation from one fumarole to another? That's really interesting. Now, um, biology is not really my forte. But from what I have read, uh, my understanding is that there are uh, a number of um, organisms that are similar uh, in the various areas where there are fumaroles, but then there are many others that are different from place to place. And that depends on the type of minerals that are most prominent in those areas. So for example, if you have minerals that use methanogen, uh, cycle. I'll back up to that, uh, where you have, you know, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and so on. Um, that you might have different microbes than if you have ones like. Remember that beginning of the talk, I talked about this lake that was underneath Antarctica, uh, where they had uh, you were using a little bit different cycle. It was related to use of um, sulfur and uh, uh, carbon and something else. Um, different type of chemical process. And so it depends on the abundance of certain types of, of chemicals and uh, structures uh, that are released or um, are created in, in combination with the heat and so on around those fumaroles. Uh, you might get slightly different kinds of, um, of microbes. So on the earth, many of them are similar. And there are a number of unique ones to each uh, area of fumaroles where you have different chemical compositions. Uh, I would expect the same thing on Enceladus or Europa, for example. Yeah, sounds good. Um, we have one comment from Marissa. Fabulous presentation tonight. I learned so many new things. So All right. Um, well, good. Not, seeing, not seeing any more questions. Um, Rick, thank you so much for once again, you, you've done this several times um, for sharing with us tonight. Um, next week, I'd like everyone to know that Laura Marcelia will talk about um, the February night sky. Um, it, once a month, we do a, a program about what's up in the sky in that month, and, and that's next week. Peak has also started a monthly trivia night. And on February 9th, the trivia theme is Wild Love. Check peaknature.org for details and to register. Thanks again for tuning in. Um, we hope to see you at, at, um, at future astronomy presentations every Friday night at 7 p.m. Um, thanks, everyone, and good night.